if something starts, and they've been lucky they haven't had any big accidents. Now, we started to see a big banking accident potentially unwind, I'm sorry, start to unravel last spring with Silicon Valley Bank and, and, and mm -hmm. Signature Bank. And, and then they put in the, 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 the bank lending facility. And so if something starts to go wrong at a moment in time where inflation is not necessarily under control, I can see them fiddling the, you know, the goalposts. Bill Fleckenstein, how are you? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for joining me today. A lot of stuff is going on in the marketplace. What are your thoughts at the end of the year here, just looking back? And what are you looking at for 2024, looking forward? Well, I think, I think 2023, I think the equity market surprised people, including myself, as to how resilient it was given the fact that rates kept rising for most of the year. The problem when analyzed in the equity market is the fact that it's so distorted by the amount of passive money that's run for corporate America via Van corporate America retirement accounts run by uh, Vanguard, BlackRock, et cetera. So since it's, you know, roughly 50% of, of the amount of, 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 of flows and transactions, it really kind of warps the market's function as a discounting mechanism, right? I mean, you know, Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, whoever said it, you know, in the short run, the market is a weighing, sorry, a voting machine. And in the long run, it's a weighing machine. But the amount of, of voting that gets done now is kind of warped the weighing part. And it's also warped, I believe, the discounting function. So it's it, 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 it harder to get a read on what individual industries or companies may mean by their action vis-a-vis -vis the news or the overall action of the market. So it's, it's, it's much harder to have a strong opinion of, about any of that. And then the other thing that's confusing now relative to what we've seen in the last, say, couple of decades has been the fact that the nominal growth has been quite strong as the rate of inflation has been much higher in the last couple of years than we experienced uh, for the couple of two decades. So you have the situation where you have recession-like characteristics in some industries, but none of the accompanying signs of an early recession uh, in the job market at all. Now, job market is lagging and there's reasons why the job market is more distorted, but all of that I think is just to say that I don't have a really strong opinion because it's hard to formulate something you have a lot of confidence in, in, in general. So I, I'm just trying to be alert to clues as to which way things are breaking. And really the equity market is so, again, is so distorted because of that. And then the amount of money that's in option related products. So the noise factor on any given day when you look at the trading is just immense. So I'll just kind of leave it there. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because I would agree that it's, especially the equity market's really distorted, but do you think we can get a, a clearer picture with the bond market? Bonds have recently rallied in the last, I want to say three to four weeks, but it's hard for me to see interest rates being as high as they are for that to be good for stocks. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? And yeah, and also the <laughs> bond yield curve is still inverted. So, which is a typically a preceptor to a recession. So yeah. What are your thoughts on all of that? Well, the yield curve recession, we all know that the track record of consistency in the yield curve predicting recession. We don't know what the lead lag time is going to be. And again, if you have 5% inflation and 5% nominal GDP growth, it doesn't quite feel like having zero GDP growth and zero inflation. So the, the, the real number feels different depending on the levels of the nominal. And I can't put that into any kind of precise terms, but I think we're basically in a stagflationary period. I think we've been in one and we'll continue to be in one unless something comes along to really move us. So 
Some things will behave in recessionary fashion. Others won't. I don't think there's going to be any strong growth anywhere. Maybe some specific niches or an individual company or two that are situated correctly. <clears throat> but for the market, I think if you just kind of said, well, I think it'll be more stagflationary, like GDP growth won't be that great. Inflation, inflation will be sticky. Rates will be sticky. The people that think that they're going to get some magnificent bond market rally, I think are crazy because even if the economy does weaken enough for the Fed to cut, you know, the, the, the window that you're going to have to, to, to capture that bond market rally is going to be rather small, I think, because, you know, the Fed's not going to be able to get as aggressive as they've been able to do. They were able to behave incredibly irresponsibly for a couple of decades. And most importantly, in the last decade, we're not going back to that. Their hands will be tied by the underlying inflation. And they might think it's in the rear, rear view mirror and, and then they'll get surprised. I mean, you know, as far as transitory goes, price, lots of prices move around. The price of gasoline, the price of oil moves around for a lot of reasons. So it moves up and moves down. And there, some, a lot of those moves are quote unquote transitory. But what isn't transitory is the overall price level. You know, it, it, net, in, in, net, net, a group of goods and services goes from, Ten dollars to fifteen dollars, and let, let's say it happened in a year, so it's up fifty percent. Well, if the next couple of years it only goes up one percent, then the rate of inflation has declined dramatically, but the right. overall price level hasn't; it's still up. You right. know? So, and and I think that's part of what people miss, and part part of gets missed in all this dialogue. Just because it's gone from fifty percent back to one, in my hypothetical example. Doesn't mean that it's under control and it can't pick up again, right? So I think the inflation surprises are going to continue, are, are going to be on, on its stickiness, not its transitoriness. And that will complicate the life of the Fed, to complicate the life of Janet Yellen. Um, obviously, there have been some games played in the way that the, that, that uh, treasuries have been auctioned in terms of what part of the curve they're being issued at and all that. And that helped the bond market at a moment in time where it was set up rather bearishly. Then the data came in a little light. Janet played a few games and we had this big, big rally. You know, I think if you're really a big believer in the economy's going off a cliff and the Fed's going to cut, you're probably better off to speculate on shorter rates rather than longer rates. But that's a, that's another issue. That's kind of a game for, for people who are, are, are true professionals in the industry. Yeah, well, I would like to talk about that in a minute, but going on your theme of inflation, it's interesting that I guess I see the concept of inflation targeting, which I think is absurd, but they have a 2% or historically, well, historically is the wrong word. In the last several years, they've had a target of 2% of yeah, inflation. They made, they made it up along the way and they said <laughs> it often enough and the global mainstream media printed it as though it's been a guide forever when it's, <laughs> right. it's just something they made up. Right. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I would agree. But my question is, is that they might have made it up, but that's where the target is, yeah. right? Yeah. And with the that's numbers, the and with the numbers that they're giving, with the with the current numbers that they're giving, believe them or not. So my question is, is do you think that will that target will change? Because it seems to me like if we are to get a two percent inflation, again, according to their numbers that they've given. There's going to have to be a lot more pain. It's just hard for me to see the the Fed going to two percent without the economy dropping off a cliff. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree with you. I think the Fed is getting given credit for being tough because they, to their credit, raise rates you know five hundred basis points essentially, and that some amount of rate rise was appropriate. Uh, I would have probably handled it differently and said. Let's get rid of the balance sheet, but they were never going to do that. On the other hand, the Fed put themselves in the pickle where they had to do that by being irresponsible with the QE and the, and the rate rises and the, all the fears and speeches of inflation that was too low as, it, as if that was some sort of big danger, which they continually kept talking about. So, but they're not tough guys. No. They're a bunch of pussies. And so <laughs> if... Something starts, and they've been lucky they haven't had any big accidents. Now, we started to see a big banking accident potentially unwind, I'm sorry, start to unravel last spring with Silicon Valley Bank and, and, and Signature Bank and 
And then they put in the, 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 the bank lending facility. And so if something starts to go wrong at a moment in time where inflation is not necessarily under control, I can see them fiddling the, you know, the goalposts. Uh, how it would play out, I don't know. Would, would they, in a, in, a, in a right kind of period, change their inflation target? Yeah, they could. You know, there's no, there's no point talking about that now because we don't have the right macro set up for, 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 to even think about that or whether they pursue what yield curve control. So they might do any number of things that we're not contemplating right now, but we will, you'll need some sort of, of trouble for that, whether it's financial system problems, whether it's problems uncovered by marks to market in areas where there haven't been, whether it's commercial real estate affecting, you know, regional banks or and money center banks or venture uh, uh, and, and um, LBO, private equity kinds of marks. I think we all know that there's got to be a lot of mismarks, whether that could be bad enough in some area uh, to precipitate some a problem. I, I would think if the transmission mechanism that's most obvious, though it doesn't mean it'll play out that way, would be the regional banks because they're already sitting on a bunch of treasuries we know that are underwater. And, you know, we get, there have been enough cases of sort of jingle mail in the, in the corporate real estate, I'm sorry, commercial real estate world, whether hotels or buildings, that there's some drastically bad marks. So, uh, I, but I, I, I just don't know. But in the absence of some real trouble, they're probably not going to do much. And I don't think you'll see any cuts either, unless, you know, again, something happens that to, to kind of moves them off the, off the mark. Got it. So on the same theme of the bond market, it's interesting because, and then what are your thoughts on this? Because I've seen, we've seen some auctions that haven't gone well, if you would. And I use that as air quotes in, I'm operating under the assumption because the Fed has stopped quantitative easing. My question to you is, if fewer people are buying, what would stop the Fed from doing QE again in a, to keep no, rates low? Nothing would stop them other than the fact that they, the inflation problem is front and center and it's gotten their attention and they have trouble focusing on more than one thing at once. So as long as they're as long as they perceive inflation to be their public enemy, number one, as long as the public's uh, upset about it, and I don't think they really care much about the public, but they're, they, the Fed's under criticism because of inflation and, and they don't like that. So they're willing to fight inflation, quote unquote, you know, as long as it doesn't get too painful. Right. And so, I mean, there have been lots of poor auctions. It's tough to see who wants to buy this massive supply, which is why Janet shifted the the funding to the shorter end because there, there's there's lots of demand at the short end, and so I don't. I twenty four will be rough from that standpoint, from a treasury funding standpoint. Then it's also going to be an election year, and you know the wild card I think is if the dollar can can find a reason to get weak. I mean, there's plenty of reasons I can make up, but if that were to get weak, that would complicate the picture. Maybe a lot's going to hinge on what the Japanese do. Because if the BOJ does what it keeps hinting at, hint, unhint, hint, unhint, you know, that they're finally going to let rates rise and abandon YCC, then if, 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 if money gets, if, if, if more money gets repatriated to Japan and the yen can't be the source of carry, that'll, that would put, that would, that would, that would, that would be even more problematic for the treasury market. And if the yen were to rally, which it would, if the, the BOJ was doing that and they were repatriating capital, then you could have a situation where there could really maybe be some real angst about the, the, the different refundings. And would the Fed have to do something clever there? Uh, uh, I can see a scenario where it would happen. It, it, it doesn't seem very likely at this juncture, but it's certainly very plausible. And as we've seen, events go from being impossible to unavoidable in a short space of time these days, macro events, but it takes, you know, so there's always a, a much longer fuse on any of this stuff than you would ever, that then that would ever seem logical. It's hard for me. And again, I, I see it as plausible as you pointed out, but it's hard for me to see the, the Bank of Japan 
letting interest rates float just because the yen carry trade's been on for so long, so many people would get hurt. But that's well, just it, doesn't, it only matters if they don't care if other institutes, they don't want their banking system yeah. to get hurt. Right. So right. they've been giving the guys the wink, wink behind the scenes for quite some time now. <laughs> so right. I am, my friend, uh, James Aitken, who's very thoughtful on this topic, thinks that Japan will be in a full hiking cycle in 2024. Wow. So that if he took, yeah, he, uh, I mean, he, he's kind of way above average batting average on these kinds of topics. So I would love to chat with him. That would be crazy in my, I mean, I am not saying that that is not in the cards. You have to look at the entire spectrum, but I just see that as, well, wow. the yen, the, the, you know, Look, they're trying, if, if, once they finally realize that they've ignited inflation over there, which they have, weak currency is not good for them. Right. And they don't want inflation to, uh, at some point, they, they'll, they'll be so happy with themselves for having created inflation. Why they wanted to is idiotic, but that's a different issue. Um, that they'll, then they'll have to deal with it. And, uh, and you know, the domestic savers are not going to be unhappy if rates start rising because they're having to deal with the inflation. And so... Uh, I, I, I mean, it only seems crazy because it's been so long since they've done anything like that. Right. But I mean, I, I think it's entirely plausible and, you know, it won't matter till it starts to matter. Right. So that really leads me in and what's your thoughts. And this was really two things. Um, it's hard in my mind and want you to comment on this. It's hard to go wrong I, or I don't see how you can go wrong buying the short end of the curve on the bond yields, buying the two-year, meaning, and what you're basically doing, you're taking a little bit of, of yield and just being on the side of things. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sorry. No, I, I would like your thoughts on that. And then I have another thought. I, I think that's exactly right. I don't, I don't, I mean, you know, obviously you're not locking anything up if, if that's your intention, but I mean, it's, I don't, I don't, it's not clear enough about how events will play out to, to want to lock these rates aren't high enough to want to lock them up i don't think so yeah i think two years and under is a pretty good place to be with money that you're not sure what you want it if you're not sure what your next step is going to be that's a pretty good place to uh hang out i i would i completely agree with you about that and then my next thought is it seems like in this inflationary or monetary inflation we'll even ask that inflationary environment the only place I see value is in commodities. And, and I don't know what your thoughts about that, and especially the equities. It's just, I've never seen a lot of these assets as cheap as they, they are now. And the problem with value investing is they become, they tend to gain more value. <laughs> so I was right. just with that, your thought of I think I think you're right. Look. Americans are, have been slow to grasp the idea that we have an inflation issue. For a long time, the, the inflation rate in this country, in my opinion, was never what the CPI said it was. The CPI is a bad index. As people are now discovering yeah. with, uh, uh, you know, owner's equivalent rent, substitution, adonics, and now it's, it's gotten a lot. But I mean, for the longest time, people didn't know about that. And the inflation rate was stated at X and it was probably X plus something. And of course, it's different for everyone because everyone's buys different types of products and has different amounts of capital. Americans seem unwilling to, to own anything that might protect them from inflation, even though it, you know inflation is a problem. You see the rest of the world accumulating gold, but you don't see Americans accumulating gold. And uh, and the same would be true for other commodities, I think. I mean, uranium's had a pretty big run, but, but in general, commodities are, are not anything most people care much about. And they are difficult businesses. Extraction businesses are difficult. And... Uh, you know, they tend to be cyclical, but a lot of the equities in those, particularly gold money equities, are really rather cheap, you know, on a cash flow basis. They're as cheap as they've ever been, but no one seems to care. But I think there's also, away from that, you know, there's, the, there's, there's, there's plenty of smaller cap companies that are reasonable too. You know, this warpage of how investing gets done at the margin every year, you know, money gets redeemed away from active managers and as people get older and, and for other reasons, and money goes into the passive scheme. And so that tends to take away the stock picking aspects. So things stay cheaper, longer, and they don't work. And then they catch a bid and people gravitate to them. So I think you're right. There's a lot of, of 
interestingly priced equities in the land of commodities. What will cause that to change? I, you know, people's perceptions about the need to have some inflation protection, I would think. What data point causes that exactly? I, I couldn't tell you. Something will, but what it's going to be, I, you know. Right. Just, uh, okay. And so lastly, I guess, as uh, I'm curious to see was what's, what's your, probably your biggest concern financially, I mean, in a macro sense, going into 2024, is it some more regional bank failures? Is it inflation or on the flip side of that, an overaggressive Fed? Not to say that they're overaggressive, but I hope you know what I mean. Well, um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, comes in. I don't have any fears about any of those kinds of things because whatever way it shakes out, there's a way to make money on it, generally speaking, whether it's long or short. And I don't particularly care if I'm long or I'm short. I mean, obviously being long is always better because the upside's open-ended as opposed to being capped. But I don't, I don't have a lot of fears about any of that stuff. What I, what I, my biggest fear is the growth of passive because it makes the job of investing so much harder. And we're just continuing to build the ticking time bomb that one day is going to really cause a lot of grief sometime in the next few years. My bigger fears are some of the lunacy that goes on in the social side of things, whether it's, you know, what goes on in universities and schools and things that are, you know, happening in America that are bad for us as a country. I have a lot of fears about those kind of things, but they're not necessarily investable. In, in terms of invest, in, investable fears, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I used to worry about the Fed, but I, you know, I know what they're going to do now, right? And they've well, already, there's no going back to responsible after you've been this res irresponsible, allowed this much can kicking to go on to fund the size of these deficits and, 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 and the size of the national debt. I mean, they're trapped. The only question is when it's going to become clear to everyone or the masses that they're trapped and then they'll, you know, then the investment landscape will change for certain assets when that, when that becomes clear. So anyway, I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much for your thoughts. And if people want to learn more about you and, or get in touch with you, go ahead and how would, how would they do that? You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my uh, handle is at FleckCap and my website is FleckensteinCapital.com. I, I write a commentary and uh, answer questions. I've been doing it for well, over 25 years, and it's a pay site. It's uh, about 12 bucks a month, priced cheaply. Okay. Just, just enough to above zero, so it's not free, but not enough to scare you away. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Bill. Sure. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure.